I think that's one of the things that I want to get more involved in as I come out talking about <laughs> taking weed for my anxiety is how do I help my community, Los Angeles, make sure that as we adopt in 2018 weed being legal, we get people out of our prison systems here in LA and we make a lot of noise about it and we're loud about it because it's insane how many people are sitting in county jail for something that as of January 1st, 2018 will be legal here. You're listening to Out of Line with Caroline Lee, exploring offline realities with online personalities. Jessica Zolman, also known as Jay Zombie, is a self-taught photographer from San Francisco who is currently based in Los Angeles. Jessica was Instagram's fifth employee and first female hire back in 2011, and she served as their community evangelist for nearly two years. She also spent a season working at a little company called Facebook. In 2013, she set out on her own to pursue her passion for taking pictures full-time. I put out a call on my own Instagram story asking if anyone would be open to talking about drugs on this podcast, and I was over the moon when Jessica responded. She's a fellow lover of bright colors, Los Angeles, and being an authentic human. So it was an absolute joy to have her over to my place to record this podcast. Ah, sweet. I'm super stoked, as you know. But (laughs) basically, when I was thinking about having you on, and then you actually mentioned to me when I was posting on Instagram, hey, is there anyone that would be open to talking about drugs? Drugs. (laughs) <laughs> and I was so stoked that you replied because I was like, yes, you were someone that I really wanted to have on anyway. So it was the most amazing and perfect topic uh, match. So tell me just basic, like when I posted who wants to come on and talk about drugs, what came up for you that you were like, yes. Um. So I think the thing for me, oh, should I introduce myself? No, way? don't even worry Great. about it. Don't worry about it. Great. Okay. So I think the... <laughs> So I think the thing that came up for me is I don't really talk about my use of drugs in order to manage my anxiety publicly. And I think my big thing going forward is like removing stigma from a lot of taboo subjects in my life and really owning who I am and what I do and also removing a lot of that taboo. I feel like if we can talk about these things that people often try and hide about themselves or about their needs especially when it comes to mental health, then, you know, more people will be emboldened and their voices will be heard and maybe legislation will change and people won't feel so alone. So, I mean, those were all the things that came up when I saw it. I also was like, I enjoy talking about my experience with drugs, not just medical marijuana use, but, you know, fun recreational stuff that I've done. So, yeah, I was like, I'm game. I'm in. Oh, my gosh. Well, (laughs) you are making my day because um, I absolutely agree with you. And one of the reasons that I started this podcast is to break taboos. I want to talk about things that everyone experiences and does and feels ashamed to talk about, whether it has to do with social things, mental health things, relational things. Um, I want to talk about it all. So. And especially as people who are known online, there is an element of like, oh, maybe we need to present this kind of perfect little, like maybe we don't talk about anxiety or maybe we don't talk about drug use because, you know, how taboo and how kind of shameful almost. Shame is almost the word that comes to mind. So I really am so stoked to dive into this. So tell me, can you just kind of give me like a brief overview of your <laughs> your kind of relationship with different different drugs and or even like you were talking about mental health. Yeah, so I would say in high school I was a pretty good kid. We'll start there because I feel like that's everyone's first drug experience. <laughs> um, I was like middle of the road cool. I wasn't like in the popular group, but I was friends with a lot of people. I, people were fine. In high school I had a good time. Um, so I would go to parties a lot and I would drink And then once in a while, like starting junior year, I would get high. That was like my first experience. Um, People did hard drugs. We lived in a really white, really rich neighborhood growing up in the East Bay. Um, So people were like doing coke and everyone was doing ecstasy. And I like really did not have an interest in that. Um, I don't know. I honestly, I have a single mom. And so I think my biggest fear was disappointing her. 
to me, getting drunk was already bad enough, but she was super chill and would pick me up from parties and was very much, I know you're going to do it. If you are going to do it, be smart. If you need a ride, leave your car and call me. I wow. won't be mad at you. So she's kind of already established these cool mom rules. Um, but I still think weed was kind of off limits for her. So that was my I'm still being sneaky and rebellious experience. Um and I didn't do it too often. I don't know. It wasn't a big deal. Um, and then I got to college and I definitely did drugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that college was the I'm free. I'm away from my mom. I went to community college first and lived at home to save my mom money. Um, and so my junior and senior year in college were the first time living away from home and being on my own. And yeah, I, I definitely abused prescription drugs um, and learned very quickly that I can get addicted to opioids. Um, I don't have an addictive personality, but when you see something starting to take over your life really quickly, I was able, thank God I don't have an addictive personality, I was able to pull the reins back and take a step back and be like, you are not allowed to take, you know, these types of drugs. Yeah. You black out, you spiral, you do things that you don't have control over, you don't know what other people are going to do to you like be smart let's be smart mm -hmm. um and was that something that you initiated for yourself you yeah. were, you were the one that created yeah boundaries? I was putting myself in a dangerous position and in dangerous situations and I was saying it was for fun and for freedom but really I was not in control um and it didn't feel good to have those experiences to all of a sudden come out of a blackout and you're in a hospital and your friend's in a hospital bed and you're like, I don't know how I got here. I don't know how my friend got here. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. Why am I in a hospital sitting next to my friend? I mean, like really scary situations that weren't that weren't good. They weren't. It just wasn't fun, mm. you know, and to me, like, yes, escapism and making bad choices. They're all part of growing up. Um, but yeah, I, I stepped back and I recognized, like, this is not healthy. Um, but it took a while. It took, like, two years. I, okay. was, I was doing dumb stuff. I mean, I was, like, crushing up Xanax and bathroom bars and snorting it. It's, it's not great. It was not great. Well, yeah. You did it. Yeah, I did it. Where did you <laughs> move to a different state for college? No, I went to school in Santa Barbara, party school, you know. I, I got into Berkeley and decided I didn't want everything about my college experience to be academia. And to me, from what I knew growing up in the East Bay and the people that I knew who ended up going to Berkeley, that really was what it was going to be. So I, I definitely made a distinct choice to go to a lifestyle party school and to get my education there because um, I still didn't know who I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. And I majored in English. Like, what do you do with that? So <laughs> you become a photographer. You become a photographer. <laughs> but I did get a lot of life experience and I did learn a lot of lessons through drug experiments i do not mess with anything that isn't natural anymore that's mm. hard line i you know i had a couple uh ecstasy experiences after that in san francisco because it's san francisco um that were amazing and fun and wonderful and with safe people but that was a totally different path and choice and i felt like i was making that choice for myself too um not being pressured by anyone that i was with mm as opposed to college where I definitely felt pressured by the people that I was spending time with. Yeah. yeah. So when you were in college and when you were with a sort of party school environment, um, maybe, maybe things that don't even have to do with your experiences specifically, but what were things that you noticed about kind of party drugs, the party drug culture? Are there things that you learned or observed that you can kind of share? Yeah, I think for me, a lot of the experiences that I had, unfortunately, were men pushing hard drugs on a lot of our female, the women that I hung out with and partied with. Um, I don't think always to take advantage of them, but sometimes do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't want to say that was my first experience with that because it absolutely wasn't. But I think it was one of my first experiences with seeing men being like blatant predators mm. um, and like young men too. So it was really disappointing. And I think for me, that was probably one of the first times when I noticed that that behavior is like prevalent. You know, you hear about it, especially when you're in community college or that's not at all like that. So you hear about this college campus lifestyle. Um, but yeah, going to UCSB, you really see it. Um, 
try not to like out anyone or anyone's experiences, but thankfully I avoided a lot of that. Um, even even with the blackout experiences that I did have that were terrifying and scary, um, I surrounded by myself with strong women who looked out for each other. Mm. I kind of always have. Um, so we always made sure that we were out of those situations safely. But you still are seeing it. And it's gross and it's creepy and it's horrible. So, mm. Would you say if you went, let's say, I mean, we're all much older and wiser now, but <laughs> if you went back to college now, let's say, w- are there any kind of, um, is there such a thing as doing those drugs safely? Mm, I mean, there's no real safe way to crush up and snort Xanax, honestly. Don't do that. I would say don't do that. Um, the other thing that I definitely did, which is funny because it just is like, to me, a casual thing. I definitely took my friend's Adderall in order to cram for finals. Like, and I went to a quarterly school. <laughs> so that's three times a year. Um, I know, like, don't do that. I, I don't know. It. It's weird. I mean, my husband has ADHD, so he takes Adderall and we've been together for six years and I've never once in a six year period thought I should take that now. So it's really clearly not a good decision. Um, I think bringing it back to using weed, obviously for me and this is super personal, it it works. It calms me down. It helps my anxiety. I think a lot of the things that I was trying to fix when I was in college probably could have been helped if medical marijuana was an option. Mm. Um, Especially the crippling anxiety over finals and your future and what are you doing and failing classes that actually don't matter, like philosophy. I just took it for fun. It didn't matter that I was failing. Um, I think a lot of those things could probably be mitigated with, you know, properly dosed weed usage. Um, And I just didn't have access to that. I unfortunately had access to like prescription drugs right yeah wow well and like you said when you when you said the the proper dosage like that is that to me is one of the key reasons why medical marijuana and why making it legal is actually such a good thing because there is no control over dosage or strength or any like there's no control over any of it when yeah. it's illegal totally um so yeah i mean you probably know more about that that than i do yeah tell me about that so for me um i i have asthma so i have a double whammy i can't actually smoke weed even <laughs> using like vaporizers i still it really hurts my lungs um and i normally hate edibles They are too strong and you are kind of always constantly with brand to brand trying to figure out what will work for you. Um, But I found this incredible brand called um, Grown. It's in Portland. They're Portland based and it's a chocolate bar company. And they really, really clearly tell you what their um, dosage is per bar. And it's probably been the most consistent experience with a like artisan chocolate that I've ever had. Um, They are in the shape of like Hershey's mini bars like when you get the big bar you can break it down into pieces and if i have half of one of those i'm good like i am laughing which is great when i'm having an experience with depression in my life and i'm relaxed and i'm enjoying whatever it is that i'm doing um the other thing that i do is cbd that's pretty constant so um i use this company called charlotte's web yeah i've heard of them i love them (laughs) they're like lifesaver for my anxiety um The other one is high. Like, I get high. I get THC with that one. Um, But the Charlotte's Web is an oil, and it's only CBD, and no high. I Like, you just feel calm. So, for example, I spent four and a half hours on a Friday night in traffic going to Palm Palm Springs, um, got sexually harassed along the route by some dudes in a truck. I was, like, level 10 anxiety, just about to break. And... That's not fun when you get to Palm Springs for a birthday party. Um, So I had some of that Charlotte's Web oil, knowing that we were going to be drinking. And so I didn't want to also get high, like immediately relaxed. All of the things that I would have normally been endlessly complaining about with my friends, because that's a side effect of my anxiety, gone. Mm. I just was able to like be in the moment and put all of that in the past and like move forward and forget about it, Um, which is really hard for me to do at base level anxiety me moving forward, not dwelling. Those are all, you know, side effects of my anxiety. Um, that CBD oil definitely helps me manage. Yeah. So my grandpa is 94. 
He's a food chemist. He worked for Wrigley's, the chewing gum company, awesome. um, in the ooh, 60s, 70s, something around there. Yeah. And um, he invented like Big Red Gum, and he is a total genius when it comes to food chemistry. And he's the one who told me about CBD oil recently it's because amazing. he was like, it's amazing. It changes your life. He started taking it for joint pain, and he said that he was expecting to take it for joint pain. Um, and yet it had all these other things that it helped with. Like he had a hard time swallowing for years after a mini stroke. Oh, wow. And he said that all of a sudden his swallowing went back to normal. And he gave me this huge list of all these things that had changed and made his life better. And he, he was the one, like my 94 year old grandpa yeah. was the one that was like, CBD oil is awesome. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. And so then he funny. gave me the full rundown of what it is. So Maybe for anyone who's listening that's like, what's CBD oil and what's THC, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Can you do, can you give like, this is what that is, this is what that is? I think I can. I did not memorize it. I probably should have done a little research. No, no, you're good. So basically THC, from my understanding, is the thing that makes you high. It's in the, weed. In right? weed. Yeah. So there's different um, chemical elements within weed. And THC is the one that gives you the head high. It's the thing that gives you the munchies. It's what makes you, right? It's like your brain goes away. Um, but CBD is the element that relaxes your body. So when you are high and your brain's somewhere else, but your whole body is melted into the couch, it's sort of like that. It's that element. It's the physical element. Um, and when you pull the THC out, you no longer get a head high. You don't feel foggy. You don't, you just, you don't feel high. And it allows the the pieces that either relax your muscles or calm your anxiety or help you swallow or reduce your pain if you're in pain, it enhances those things when you pull specifically the CBD out of the weed. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how they managed to pull them apart. I mean, chemistry is amazing and science is the best, but I'm like beyond grateful for mm. it. Well, the, the tagline of this podcast is put it in your mouth, but don't swallow. But maybe <laughs> now it just needs to be put in your mouth. And if you take in... CBD, then you can swallow. Yeah, you can swallow that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that yeah. one's a stretch, but I like it. I like it. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned Charlotte's Web because I know I listened to You Made It Weird Yeah, with Pete Holmes. Um, his podcast is amazing. And I know he is like sponsored by Charlotte's Web and oh, awesome. always says that they're like his favorite. So yeah. you, what, what do you love that they make? So they have um, an oil that's mint chocolate. Um, it's the one product that I know about because it's the one I just repeat order all the time. It's not cheap, like fair warning, but it's lasted me for forever. Um, I don't use it on a daily basis. I use it as needed. And I, I, I know it doesn't give you a head high, but I do not use it when I drive. I like make a point of only using it when I am in a situation where I can relax. And I just don't want to be the person that gets in a car accident. And now CBD is taken away from everyone. Um, <laughs> so I'm really cautious about that. Um, but yeah, they make an oil. It's kind of gross. It doesn't taste great. Per Sorry, Charlotte's Web, if you're listening. But um, <laughs> personally, I, like it's a little you're putting oil in your mouth and then I usually just fizzy water gets it down. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing and incredible and has honestly changed my life. Wow. Yeah, that's a big that's a big call. Yeah. What um, when do you decide whether to take CBD and when do you decide whether to take the chocolate um, do you say grown? Yeah, grown. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't really drink anymore. I think for me, I'll have a beer here or there, but drinking is truly a depressor for me. And I have had, especially recently, these last few years, experiences with depression. Um, and I personally just want to choose not to use a substance like that for it, um, especially since it really enhances my depression. So if I go out with friends and they're getting drunk and they're at a bar, um, I'll usually Uber and have half a chocolate. And so I'm like, I'm a little high and and like the weed that I get is makes me really giggly. So I'm having a great time and then I'm just having water the whole time. And yeah, I, people don't I'm not having kids, so people don't question me <laughs> whether or not I'm pregnant. Usually people know that that's what I've done. Um, but also I'm not friends with people who try and pressure me to drink, which is great. Um, so I would say socially, that's usually when I use it um, or like a house party or something. And then, yeah, I don't know, if I'm at home and we're going to watch Planet Earth, I'll take a little. Or if I had a really stressful day and I am done I'll take some, um, but I really, I don't take it that often. I, again, I like really try and make sure that I'm not 
leaning on it mm-hmm. for my issues. Like if things are getting really bad, I'm calling up the therapist. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think sometimes just being able to, for me, it's a treat yourself. If mm-hmm. I'm starting to use it as a crutch to get through something, mm, not so great. But if I'm like, I've had a bad day, I'm angry, I'm fine, like I'm doing okay in life, but I just need to relax, I will definitely have a little bit of that chocolate. I like it. Yeah. Is it a social thing? Like, do you take it with people? Like, let's say you and your husband, are you like, oh, let's let's get high together? My is husband it- doesn't really do drugs which is funny. It's mostly just me, solo, <laughs> getting a little high. I mean, he thinks it's funny, and we'll play video games together. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's social only. Um, yeah, I think in order to kind of manage the I don't really drink to get drunk anymore thing, there are times when I'll get high for that reason. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's just me hanging on the couch, laughing at everything my husband says and him being like, oh, my gosh, you're so high right now. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that you don't drink because drinking, I find, especially being someone who shoots a lot of weddings, it's like you can tell the social energy of a room by how much alcohol they've had. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting that there is such a taboo attached to being high, which impairs who you are and how you act. Yeah. And yet it's totally fine to get schnockered in a room with, you know, a bride and groom when you're celebrating yeah. and to act a fool. Totally. That's totally fine. That's totally fine. And yet um, I would say that that's something that is a is sort of a social thing where you can't, like a lot of people I think believe they can't have fun without it. Yeah. Like if it's a dry wedding, people leave by like 9 p.m. Totally. Or... If it's not an open bar, people don't stay as long because there's this kind of attachment to the idea that I can only have fun if, yeah. you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think that that's such an interesting thing in terms of society. Um, and I, I think that's not everywhere because um, we've done a lot of traveling in other countries, especially countries that are like Muslim countries mm-hmm. and they don't even have access to alcohol and yet they still have tons of fun. Totally. So, it's definitely, in my experience, like an American thing. Yeah. Um, Maybe so, European, too. Well, okay, yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. give you that. I'll give you that. <laughs> so have you been in other countries and done any drugs? Oh, geez. No. I'm not even Mexico. I, I'm such like a I don't want to get in trouble kid. Um I mean, I mean, I didn't even know where to get weed. Uh, anytime I was smoking weed, even in high school, like someone else got it and then like gave it to me. Um I never had a dealer or anything. It's so (laughs) funny to think about. Like, I don't even know how weed came into my life until I got my card. So Mm -hmm. I got approved for a card for my anxiety. I I have really bad anxiety and I have um, a emotional support animal prescribed by my real therapist who was like, I can't get you a medical marijuana card. And I was like, what? How does this system work? (laughs) So... Yeah, I, I, so it, having that and having her letter for an ESA recommendation, getting approved from a doctor who's allowed to give medical marijuana licenses was like nothing. He just looked at that and was like, done. Um, but yeah, until that happened, I honestly like I didn't have access to it. And and so along that same vein, I don't mess with things in other countries, especially where they're not coming out of what I consider a prohibition mm. of sorts. Mm. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, it is a bit of a prohibition. Um, So when did you get your card? What year was that? And was that sort of the first time that you had like a practice of using? Yeah, so... Is using the right word? I don't know if using is the right (laughs) word. It's fine. Uh, I I self-medicate. I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) I think the... So the first time I got my card was two years ago, pretty recently. Um, my husband had his card when we lived in San Francisco, and so that was typically how I was obtaining anything. Um, back then, I was still smoking. Black mold in San Francisco Victorians is how I got asthma. So I was still able <laughs> to smoke back then. Um, but again, like I, San Francisco is a huge drinking city, so I was drinking a lot when I lived there. And we moved to L.A., and I think the combination of driving and also just being married was like, why am I drinking so much? And... Um, I definitely, my depression became more obvious and 
I think I always had depression, but I became more aware that that's what it was. Um, so I slowed down on drinking. When we moved here and we lived near a Green Cross. So and they had a doctor's office where they could prescribe you um, your medical marijuana license. So we went. He was like my husband was very supportive and he was like, let's go together if you have anxiety about it. Because I did. I was Before like, you got your yeah, I was like, oh my God, they're going to deny me. She's going to tell me it's a fake reason. He was like, babe, literally people walk in there and tell them their foot hurts. You're fine. Like, they're not going to deny you. This is how anxiety works. So he went with me and was like, let's get, I'll go with you. We've got this. And then I'll go with you to the store. Um, so it was really recently, yeah, that I got it. Okay. Have you tried other things to treat your anxiety? And if so, can you compare the effectiveness of the different things that you've tried compared to weed? Yeah. So for a while, I was still using the oil, the vape oil. Um, and my, then my asthma got so bad I couldn't do that. But it wasn't really fixing it. Like, I just truly was high. Like, it, again, felt like this form of escapism where I wasn't really helping myself in any way. I was just running away from who I am um, and my problems and these things that I need. So it, it was, I mean, I would say it was like a year of trial and error, you know, trying different strains of um, uh, sativa versus indica. Like what what do I actually want to use? Do I need to be functional or do I want to just fall into the couch and space out? And so a lot of experimenting with that. Um, so indica is the one that I cannot do. <laughs> That's like the ultimate escapism. The thing is indica in the couch, for those not familiar. And then sativa is the, I can function. I can do work. I am, It's mostly giggle. That's what I call it. It's like the giggle weed. You're still there. You're able to run around and, and function and be a little more social. Um, so that's what I preference. So that really helped a lot when it came to buying like chocolate bars, for example. So I prefer a high dose of sativa THC with a bit of CBD in those grown bars that I buy. Um, but it took a while to figure that out. Like there are so many different details and it, it is like organic foods these days with <laughs> the different kind of weeds and what's going to work for you and what won't. And sometimes I would try chocolate bars and I would be like gone for like a day and I was miserable and I hated it and was like, why am I even trying with like food product? Um, but yeah, once I found that company, I was like, oh, this is it. Okay, we've done it, we figured it out. So um, yeah, it, really grateful. But it's like, it, I get why people will try it and be like, nope, it gives me anxiety and it makes my paranoia really bad and I hate it and it doesn't work for me. And that might be true for like literally every single marijuana strain that you buy you may never find one that works for you because whatever it is about marijuana doesn't work but it's the same for prescription drugs right xanax might not work for you you may need a lower dose you know prozac may make you a zombie so i totally get that doing marijuana for anxiety or for depression or whatever it is um or for pain might not actually help you it may make it worse yeah and it's almost what i'm hearing is almost that it's it's a little bit of an acquired taste and it's a little bit of finding your own flavor like for example i'm just thinking about you know wine a world like wine maybe some people don't like white maybe some people don't like rosé maybe yeah. some people like you know dry reds and you can't just try one wine at a bar happy hour and be like i hate wine yeah because if you if you hate it <laughs> when you tried it once totally it might not be right but if you try seven wines and you're like i don't like any of those then maybe you don't like wine that's totally fine totally <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah absolutely but i think with with almost anything in in life there is there is trial and error even even in relationships even in the yeah. dating world you you don't go on one date and go like i don't like dating you go that totally. wasn't the right one for me yeah um and that's part of the beauty of being individuals i think is is knowing that not not everything is going to fit for this for everyone else Definitely. It's, there's there's sort of an element of um individuality about it so that's really cool so you mentioned before that now you don't take anything unless it's natural. Yeah. Um, are there other things that you take or have tried? Um, things you love, things you hate? Yeah. Um, if I want to like do drugs, 
like go to the desert and just have an experience. Mushrooms are really great. (laughs) Um, I hadn't done them. I didn't do them in high school again. I just was like, I was too good. I just was so worried about disappointing my mom. So I, and I also didn't know where the heck to get them. So I just never really did crazy drugs or anything, um, anything hallucinogenic at all in high school. And if anything, based on the experiences that I've heard, I'm really grateful for that. I think a lot of the bad trip stories that I hear are people who don't know who they are having that existential crisis as children doing drugs and like altering their brain. Um, So I didn't do shrooms for the first time until, oh goodness, maybe four, three or four years ago. Um, So I was like 28 and in a committed relationship and knew where I was in life and had this amazing career path as a photographer. And I'm like, I'm covered in tattoos. I'm like, okay, I've made my choices. Like I've done it. I'm good. Life is great. And I tried tea out in the middle of the um, forest in New Mexico. (laughs) So it was like beautiful stars and camping and surrounded by like amazing people who are just had this great energy. Um, It was, I didn't like change my life. I wasn't like, I'm a new person, but I just like, I had fun. Like it was really cool to feel more connected with nature and appreciate the stars in a way that I hadn't even thought of before. And I mean, I'm a space cadet already. So like extra space and out staring at a fire was just cool. Like everything was just cool about it. It was just fun. Um, And then I did it again, like very light eight one stem when I was with friends doing karaoke, safe environment. Um, I remember walking across the street being like, I can hear the electricity. And my husband, who's my like safe person because he doesn't do anything. He's like my guide in a way um, was like, "Okay, sweetie. And then it got really quiet. and He was like, oh, I can hear it, too. (laughs) Oh, I was like, oh, geez, okay. I I feel a little better. Like I thought for a second I was really tripping out, but instead it was like, now I can hear it as well. (laughs) We just live in Los Angeles. Um, But I'm also very grateful for him that he chooses not to, and then can kind of like, if I'm freaking out, help bring me back a little bit. Yeah, you're very ground to reality. Yeah, it's pretty nice. That's Um, amazing. But that's I would say those are the only two things I am down to do. Um, and I really, I, I mean, the last time I did mushrooms was like a year and a half ago. So it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had a bad experience? Um, or have you ever heard of anyone or been with anyone that's had a bad experience? So I will say in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico, I was laying down on a friend's stomach, staring up at the Milky Way. And at one point the stars started to turn into the alien from aliens. And I was like, oh no, this feels like a bad direction to go down. Even though I love horror, don't love it in my nature. Um, so I was like, I'm going to sit up and go on a walk. Like I kind of pulled myself back. I saw it happening and was like, no, oh, no, 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 no. Um, And then, like, I, my first time, I just didn't expect getting sick. Like, that, I have a very sensitive stomach already, like, classic Ashkenazi Jew over here. And so I just was like, this is weird. And so it made me feel, I think it brought me out of it for a while and made me feel really uncomfortable. Um, I wouldn't say I went full bad trip, though. Um, I have heard experiences from friends who were like, the walls were melting. And I saw, I looked in a mirror, never look in a mirror. My face was falling off. Like, I remember one time just examining my face in a mirror, like, for an hour, but not, I wasn't like, do I just was like, faces are cool. <laughs> um, but I've never like gone down a really, really bad path, which again, I think being an adult and being in control of my experiences and being in control of my life, I think all of those things let me have a more positive experience mm. with it as opposed to being 16 and everything is drama and the worst and a nightmare and then bringing that energy into hallucinogenics it seems like such a bad idea oh man yeah absolutely when it comes to doing shrooms and other let's say herbal herbal earth type yeah drugs do you have any sort of boundaries or even let's say there's someone listening that's like oh my gosh this sounds so interesting I've never done anything like this and I'm I'm curious but I I'm scared or I don't know I want to do it and do it wisely like you said not not like a 16 year old who's <laughs> wanting to just like party and then gets into a really dangerous situation. Totally. What are what are some right and healthy ways to experiment? So I think all of the times I've done it, I've been with people who have experienced it before. So even if people were participating in doing 
the drugs, whether it was mushrooms or smoking weed, they were all people who knew what they were doing. Nobody was new and trying it. Nobody was like, well, maybe in high school, but that's fine. Uh, I was always safe there. But um, yeah, most of the times I've done, especially with shrooms, it's with people who know. And so they're willing to help. And it's almost like this sort of community situation. I'm not doing it and then running off. Um, which I literally had a college roommate do. <laughs> Don't do that. That's scary. Um, also, I, for everything, including even weed chocolate, like small bits, like just a little bit. Just try, like if you're going to try mushrooms, just try one stem. Like you don't need to get crazy. You're going to get high and like wait. And if it doesn't work and what, it's okay. Like, you know, if your friends are down and open, which they probably are, if they're bringing you drugs or you're, <laughs> you're in a safe space, they'll probably be down to like try again. Um, I think going easy and being around people who can help you are the key things. It, like don't eat a handful and you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's really the motto. Don't eat a handful. You're going to have a bad time. <laughs> That's the biggest advice I can give anyone with anything, That's any great. drugs. That's great. Don't eat a handful. Don't eat a handful. Even with <laughs> even with candy, don't yeah. eat a handful. You'll probably feel sick at the end. Yeah. I need, it's like moderation, everything in moderation except moderation. Yeah. Well, and I think being patient too. Like mm. things will happen. It, whether it's you're trying to handle and deal with your anxiety or you're trying to have a fun time, like just be chill. Like you'll figure it out. Be in the moment. Like... It, you don't have to, after 30 minutes, be like, it's not working and That's like rush so into it. You know, it, I think this we have a lot of time on this earth generally, most of us. And so I think like really taking it easy and taking it slow and figuring it out. I think that's key. I mean, for me, that's what helped me with therapy, right? I think the first few times I did it, I really wanted to rush through. I wanted to get answers. I knew I got I could tell you my whole life. And when I went back again as an, a married adult, you know, trying to work through some of my fears, it was like, oh my gosh, I have to slow down. Like that is the, that is the key to all of this is like, take your time. Mm. That's a good one. Yeah. And, uh, and I definitely will plus one what you said about giving it time, because I think even, um, I mean, I've been to Burning Man a few times and <laughs> even sometimes there are people who, um, will say, oh, I, I, I just took something a while ago and I don't think it worked, so I think I'm going to take more or whatever. And you're always like, no, 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 don't. Yeah. Just let it. Just let just it. Just experience the things around you. Yeah. Even like, if, let's focus on this over here. Let's do this. And like, even if, <laughs> even if, let's say, let's say it doesn't work. Yeah. Let's say you try it and it doesn't work. What's the worst that could happen? You say, okay, cool. So next time I'll take a little more. Mm -hmm. That's the worst that could happen. I have a dear love in my life that I won't name. It's not my husband, but it's someone close to me. So I won't throw them under the bus, <laughs> but, um, they accidentally way overdid it. Yeah. And, um, and they didn't actually, they weren't actually even meaning to eat any edibles, yeah. but it just happened to be mixed up in like, it was at like a party food and they, they happened to eat a bunch and didn't realize what it was. And, um, yeah, they were, they were in bed for like four days because oh, they were so, so high. That, that definitely reminds me of my worst high story Tell that us. I, that just escaped me until right now. So, um, my first, I'm glad to trigger you. I know you did. So my first year living in San Francisco, I lived two blocks away from Haight-Ashbury on the Haight, Haight and Clayton, shout out Punchbowl. I literally lived a bunch that, but above that bar, it was bad. So it was my first year in San Francisco and 420 comes around and I'm, I'm walking distance to Golden Gate Park. I'm like, this is cool. I'm like 22 years old and living on my own in the city. Let's go see what it's about. So I go and it's madness. Like there's thousands of people on this hill and I spot one of my friends and I am like, great, I'm going to go see him and say what's up. And he has brownies. And I'm like, oh, dope. Like, it's 420. I live in San Francisco now. I live in the hate ashbury Let's have a little bit. Again, everything in moderation, right? Like, I know myself. I know my limits. So I have, like, a super small corner, basically one bite. And I'm like, I'm good. Things are good. No, things are not good. Like, 30 minutes later, I am losing it. I'm freaking out. I, I have to pee, and I didn't even realize I had to pee. So now I'm like, oh, my God. I've had to pee for maybe an hour now and i just like had no control over my body and didn't feel it and i'm like oh i gotta get back to my apartment i, I have to pee i'm freaking out 
So, you know, I took it an hour later. I'm flipping. I go to walk back to my place. There are so many people. I'm losing it. Like, I know where I'm going, but I can't breathe. I'm like fully freaking out. I get maybe half a block from my apartment and I fully pee my pants in the middle of the ashtray on 420 by myself. I like left them. I was like, I got this. I'm good. No, I didn't get it. Also, it's maybe 5 p.m. So it's bright, bright as heck, middle of the day, 5 p.m., pee my pants on the street. (laughs) Run into a friend, of course. And by the way, it's a guy that I have a crush on. So I'm trying to like play it cool. Like I don't have pee in my pants. Please don't notice that I have pee in my pants. I definitely don't have pee in my pants. I do. We get to my apartment. He's like, oh, I'll walk you home. Because I'm like, I'm really high. I'm trying to get home. (laughs) And he's like, I'll walk you home. Of course, I live in I live in San Francisco. There's like a thousand stairs up to my apartment. And I'm like, oh, you go first. And he's like, no, what? You go first. It's fine. You go first. And I'm like, no, no, you go first. He doesn't go first. I go first. <laughs> he didn't say anything. He was very polite. But I, I went first up the stairs. I very clearly peed my pants. And then I, I was like, OK, well, I feel horrible. I'm going to um, thanks for walking me up into my apartment. Can you leave now? And he's like, yeah, no problem. So he leaves. Door locks behind itself. It's fine. I take a shower. It's the longest shower I've ever taken in my life. I feel like I'm melting into the linoleum. I'm dying. I lay in bed. And literally, as I close my eyes, the whole room turns into that scene in Fear and Loathing in in Las Vegas with like the alligator. And I was like, oh, now I know. Okay, this is what it's like when you just get too hot. You pee your pants in front of a boy you have a crush on and the walls start melting and you die. I I was high for two full days, just in bed, out of it. I think I slept for 14 hours. Oh my gosh, that's a story. I'm so glad I triggered that. Yeah, I was a mess. So that, again, like, I tried in moderation. Yeah. We all have, there's moments. I probably should have asked, how much weed did you put in the butter? So that's maybe a a piece of advice I would offer. Ask. Apparently he put a lot in. He has a much higher tolerance than me. Is that what happened? Do you think it was just, yeah. was it the amount that you ate or was it that? I think he used super high concentration butter because he needed a lot of weed to get high. And I had a tiny amount, but because he put so much weed when he made the weed butter, it just, it like blew me away for two days. I was oh, gone. Man. It was too much. That's brutal. That's my favorite. I mean, I was young still. So I'm like, okay, that was a pretty good too much story. Let's yeah. never do that again. Yeah. You didn't like miss work <laughs> over yeah. it. But yeah. Still. It was the weekend. Thankfully oh, it was God. 420 fell on a weekend. I was that's really amazing. lucky. Oh, so lucky. But man. Well, and with now, I think that's the thing. Um, one of the other questions I want to ask you is even just like, what does it look like to make weed legal and or other drugs? Yeah. Is that good? And also, how do you do it well? Because even in LA, I mean, I go to parties sometimes and there's food out and I'm constantly thinking to myself, am I about to eat something that has something in it? And I'm going to suddenly be super high and not mean to be Yeah, like with the dear person in my life that was in bed for a week. Totally. I mean, it's that terrifies me. Yeah. So I almost don't really eat food when I'm at parties much, especially if there's cookies or brownies. If there's anything that is <laughs> yeah. anything like that, I'm just like, cool, don't eat it. I'll just stick to my cocktail and call it a day. But what would it look like to make it legal? So this is actually something that I wanted to talk about. I think, I think for me, the biggest thing with making it legal is making sure that anyone who has previously been put in jail for weed being a criminal offense immediately gets pardoned like that's a huge thing for me especially with people who are in prison for the three strikes rule just for weed for a thing that is now in cities like portland and i guess all of oregon being legalized there are still people that are serving time in jail and in prison for selling marijuana and i think The other thing is, is as weed becomes legal, it becomes gentrified. Like, absolutely. You you look at Humboldt County and a lot of the people that are growing there are white people. And and a lot of these, even the stuff that I take, the things that I love that I'm talking about, they are companies that are owned by white people. And so for me, I have been trying to make more of an effort to support black communities that are getting involved in legal weed distribution, whether that's trying to go check out one of the shops down, you know, on Silver Lake Boulevard that I know is owned um, by a black family. I think that's a huge thing. And that's a huge 
part and should be a huge part of what people are thinking about as weed becomes legalized because it is being commodified by white people and then white people are profiting while black people are still being arrested. I believe it was like 86 percent of of people still being arrested in a town where it became legalized or was on the road to being legalized. There's statistics out there. Sorry, I did not do my research, but it's high. Black people are still being prosecuted for a thing that I just have in my fridge and it's no big deal because I'm a white lady and everything's fine. Um, And I think that's shitty. That's like a shitty way to come out of genuinely like weed prohibition is to say it's totally cool that all those people who are in jail for something that is now legal and being used by white communities for profit, that they just stay there. So I think that's one of the things that I want to get more involved in as I come out talking about (laughs) taking weed for my anxiety is how do I help my community, Los Angeles, make sure that as we adopt in 2018, weed being legal, we get people out of our prison systems here in LA. And we make a lot of noise about it and we're loud about it because it's insane how many people are sitting in county jail for something that as of January 1st, 2018 will be legal here. So true. So, so true. Um, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that that's so important, especially with, I, I mean, America has the highest level of incarceration, period. Yeah. And so clearly there's a problem that we need to handle and absolutely taking responsibility and being an advocate is a huge, huge thing. And I love that. I love that responsibility. That's really, really important. And if, if you figure out ways to do that in your own journey, like if you figure things out that you can either share with us or even just share in on social media, I would love to know about it because I think that's really important whether or not someone is um, whether or not someone uses weed in their own life, it's still possible to speak up for people who are serving time for something that's not illegal anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there is a, a really, really incredible level of responsibility and just like dignity involved with yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure um, Black Lives Matter LA has resources for local communities and Black Lives Matter does have regional Um, chapters. So that probably would be a great starting point. I know that's the place that I will be starting, um, especially we're coming up on on January 1st. I know. It's Uh, so close. So yeah, I definitely want to make sure I I am involved in some way. Um, And I feel like that's probably a good starting point for a resource. Do you think with the January 1st date so close, um, do you think that sort of the face of who uses and who likes to kind of get into that. Is that scene going to change? Like, as you you said, it's almost like getting gentrified. Is it going to be one of those things where like you do yoga and then you go and you, you know, smoke a joint or eat your chocolate or is it going to become a scene? Is it going to become there's a certain type of person that already exists that just sort of adopts it? Yeah, I mean, I think... Portland has already kind of seen that happen. Um, I definitely follow some weed stores that sell like artisan ceramic pipes and like necklaces with roach clips on it. And it's very go to your yoga and then come over here and buy our beautiful wares for all of your weed needs. And like weed bars where like they're in these stunning jars in this like Apple store style. It's like, okay, that's fine. Like I get it. I let, you know, first of all, make money fine but it's such an interesting shift from the like kind of dark you know wholesaler glass display (laughs) like i mean really in the in the last couple years it's changed so much Mm. um yeah i don't i don't know like what you do to combat that um or how you stop a like apple store artisan weed shop from taking over those smaller spaces that are owned by people of color. I mean, obviously shop at those spaces where people of color are selling their goods. And if you feel like supporting your friend who started like a gentrified Silver Lake, you know, accessory store, fine. Like you can do both. You can exist in both worlds. But I think being deliberate and and knowledgeable, especially as it becomes legal, is important. Um, it will become easier for people with money and 
companies with money, especially cigarette corporations, who I know are already eyeing the industry, to purchase permits because there there are regulations and laws about where, in terms of zoning, you can set up a shop. And it is going to be easier for those people to lobby for permits and to purchase permits than it would be for people of color or people in um, underprivileged communities who could really benefit and traditionally have benefited from the sale of weed. Um, so I think that's definitely something to keep in mind mm. um, when you're shopping somewhere. I, I mean, genuinely, I'll be shocked if like Marble doesn't start opening weed shops in LA. So I think just knowing where you're buying your stuff from and being more deliberate about shopping with, I guess, legacy yeah. people who have been selling this for a long time. Right. Who aren't just getting on the bandwagon because all of a sudden they can make money from it. And a lot of money. Lot. I mean, I I own a studio space just around the corner and we had people come and scout. They wanted to rent it for a weekend long um, kind of like workshop event where they would just they and the the demographic that they described was like moms like women who do yoga every day and they were like we're gonna have you know weed creams and drinks and waters and I was like whoa people are not wasting any time to make money on this stuff and I think that there might be there might be some good that comes from that but Whenever there's a huge spike in capitalism, well, first of all, it's very America, so whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but also, it makes me a little concerned. Even feminism lately, I've just been like, okay, look, I love women. Give me all the boobs. But <laughs> when it comes to every t shirt has something to do with girl power, the future is female, when everything is all about making money because women are having a moment that to me, I'm like, no, 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 no. Now, now, now we've crossed the line because are we doing enough or are we just talking about it and making money from it? Yeah. And places like, I mean, I went into H and M the other day and it's like everywhere, like girl power, females are this, but you're giving a company money who just reinvests in itself. Whereas Other Wild makes the future is female t-shirts and they donate part of their proceeds to help LGBTQ. And and I also, I own a bag that says I went to Planned Parenthood and all I got was, and it lists everything and all of the proceeds from that go to Planned Parenthood. So you're right. Like things like that become trendy. I think weed is going to become trendy and making sure that when you are spending the money on the dope trend or whatever like you know where your money's going and and i think that's more important than ever as activism becomes cool and i think weed is not an exception to that concept of activism i think it it has been such a big thing in our lives that it should be legalized and let people use this and people can't die from it unlike alcohol right and you you look at all these statistics and it's like it's silly that it is illegal but we have to make sure that when it does become legal that it's not dominated by like big horrible businesses that don't care about you absolutely and like you said knowing where your money is going is it takes a little bit more time to do that and to to do the education, like ed- educate yourself to know where it's going, where who owns this company, where do they spend their money. But that really matters. And it really matters. I mean, even even thinking about H&M and like where their clothes are made and where, you know, who's getting who's getting taken care of when you buy that, even if it is cool, yeah. even if even if what you're getting looks cool or is great, it some sometimes if it is too affordable in air quotes, then someone's suffering from that. Totally. Maybe, it, maybe when it comes to things like H&M. But when it comes to things like we were talking about with gentrifying weed, all of a sudden, what about the people who have been in the industry for years and years and years and who have risked everything to be in it? So I think that's a really good principle just in life in general, kind of take the time to know where your money's going and care. Yeah, Definitely. And America is such a consumer capitalist everything all the time. And it's funny, being married to someone who's from Australia, he notices it way more than I do where he'll be like, wow, this is just here to make money. Um, And he'll just be like, you know, capitalism strikes again. Totally. Um, And I'm always like, oh, wow, you're right. I totally was numb to that. But being aware and noticing, are you being sold something? 
are you spending your money on something? Do you want to be spending your money on that thing? Yeah. It's a really important question to ask. Definitely. Even though it takes a little more time. It takes a little more time. But I mean, living in a world like they live where, you know, unless you put the glasses on, you don't notice that we're all like alien people who are being told to obey, right? Like, I don't want to live in that world. And yeah, um, yeah, I try and make an effort. But again, like, I use those two companies and I don't know who their founders are and their packaging is beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm making assumptions that they're white people, but um, I would not be shocked. And like, even even for me, like I am guilty of like, well, this is a thing that works and it looks pretty too. And, you know, it, it's hard not to fall into that trap. So if I can counterbalance that by the second January 1st, happens and there are people still sitting in those jail cells waiting for their trial for weed like protesting against that and being loud and petitioning and getting my friends involved like i'm going to do it Mm. It, it, it's such a no-brainer use of my extracurricular extracurricular times because families have been ripped apart by that and now all of a sudden everyone is free to use it except except they get to sit in prison like that's crazy to me it is crazy yeah um, two more questions because we were just talking about feminism as a consumerist hot hotbed. <laughs> so uh, tying that into weed, have you found that um, either CBD or or chocolate or your um, THC does that support PMS? So I am really lucky in that I have like super light and easy periods. I'm like so thankful for that. Um, I have really bad ovulation though. It's a very weird thing. When I ovulate, it's super painful. Um, So usually if I feel it and I know that it's happening and like I get a little moody, um, I'll CBD oil. I don't, we, THC doesn't help quite as much with that. Um, And yeah, like it definitely eases the symptoms. I I don't really notice um, outside of my anxiety, large mood shifts though, for me personally. Um, but it's more the pain management. Yeah, the pain management. When I'm ovulating, it's always painful. I always like feel it. It's so weird. I um, feel it too, actually. That's yeah. not that weird. Oh, okay, good to know. I mean, well, it's not that <laughs> weird. I I like to be very in touch with my body. Like, yeah, I've never been on the pill, and I don't do. I, so I'm very like aware of what's going on with my body. Um, so maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. I don't really ask a lot of people how they feel when they ovulate, but I definitely know what you mean. Yeah. I feel it. Yeah. So it helps a lot. Like that day is my in my cycle, my pain day, and it really helps. The rest of it is I'm the worst woman. Mm. I don't have I mean, I'm lucky. I just don't have cramps and it's not as big of a mess or my PMS isn't as crazy. Um, I also did find birth control that really works for me and does help regulate my mood swings if i am on nothing Mm -hmm. i'm insane and i'm sure nothing would help Mm -hmm. at the same time um so yeah i don't even want to experiment with that yeah fair enough (laughs) can you use cbd with prescription drugs and like is there anything that you can't use it with or do Um, you know I don't know. I don't take prescription medication for my anxiety. I think part of my aversion to it goes back to me knowing it wouldn't be opioids. I know that, but I just, it makes me so paranoid to put drugs consistently in my body. And I think the other thing is, is I don't consistently have anxiety. So if I'm put on an an anti-anxiety medication, you need to take it constantly in order for it to work. But I don't constantly have anxiety. My anxiety totally varies. It's situational. Um, It's, I mean, lately it's constant. Thanks, President 45. But that's another story. We don't have to talk about that right now. Uh, (laughs) But there's just like, it's always a a buzzing now. But but when it does spike, that's when I try and take it and um for me personally i just don't want to be taking a daily um it's so fine if that works and that helps and that's what you want to do like no shame just personally i would rather just have a little bit of oil when i'm feeling overwhelmed and like i can't breathe and i need to come up for some air that's awesome yeah also earlier in our conversation you said that you aren't having kids and you said it like really confidently and I love that and (laughs) I almost feel like I need to just have you back on for another episode to talk about that yeah but is there a kind of short answer of that is there can you tell me what was that decision making process like and how can you be 
so confident and sure oh, about it? Such a good question. I mean, I'm not 100% confident. My husband and I say if we both wake up in one year, two year, five years and look at each other and are like, we should have a kid. We'll try it. We'll, we'll do it. Right. But at this point in our lives, neither one of us wants to have children. Um, that wasn't always the case when we first met six years ago. He really, really, really wanted kids. Um, he was in his 30s. And as time shifted, I, I didn't know. I was like, yeah, I guess maybe not now. I'm like 25. Calm down. Um, and then when I hit 30, I like fully went into a crisis. Like, I need a baby. And he was like, what? We literally just got married. Calm down. Um, and now that I'm about to be 32, I'm like, nah, nah. I don't know. All my friends have kids. They seem so happy. I love their children. It's kind of fulfilled that need mm -hmm. um, that that I want. And the other thing is, like, I can't answer why do you want kids without coming up with really selfish reasons or like these strange like there's not enough smart liberal. I don't know. It's so dumb. Like it just every reason that I have feels like a dumb, selfish reason. And it just doesn't make sense. Like there's just so many children. Um, the other thing is, is we said if we're if I'm 40 and he's 45 and we decide by that point, we probably are going to be doing OK since we're both freelance and we'll look at adoption process. It's expensive. It's complicated. There's literally legislation trying to make it more difficult. To I know. Adopt or get refunds for adopting. It's so dumb. But that's the other thing that we said is if it's quote unquote too late, <laughs> I don't want to do IVF. Um, it's just too expensive and I don't want to put my body through that personally. Um, and so we're like, we'll adopt. Like if I'm 40 and he's 45, we'll start that process. Um, but it's, a, we're playing it by ear and right now is a hard no. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's a complicated, that was a long way of saying like, just not right now. No, that's good. That's yeah. good. And, and it's, it's good to be in relationship with, um, the kind of ebbs and flows of life and, and how that yeah. changes. Cause I think. I think it's really good to just be in relationship with the fact that things change and, um, you know, everything from hormones to circumstances to finances, yeah. everything changes. So I love that you're just kind of like in it yeah, and, and kind of open. Well, and I think the big thing for us right now is as we're both freelance and like we can barely afford to pay for our health insurance as two freelance couples Oh, thanks, America. And so um, that's another big thing that we think about as we watch our other freelance couples have kids and their insurance goes up to the price of a really nice apartment in Boston. We're like, why? OK, that's just for insurance. Like to have a kid and then go into debt is like, what's the point of that? And, you know, and then we looked long term and it's like, what's the long term goal? So like someone takes care of us when we're old. Like, I don't know that that's a good reason either. I mean, like so happy all my friends are having babies and they're doing their thing. I'm a godmother to like the most beautiful child in the Aww. world. I love him with all my heart. Like babies are great and I'm happy that other people are making that choice for themselves. We just like everything that we talked about, we were like, that, these are the most selfish reasons. There's like so many people in this world is, do we need to, mm -hmm. do we need to, mm -hmm. can we think of a better reason? No. Okay. <laughs> we'll shelve it. We'll like shelve it. that idea. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I like it. We'll come back to this in a year. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh man. So much good. Um, is there anything else in terms of the, the drug convo topic experiences, anything else you want to you want to cover before um, we dive into actual social media talking like don't do cocaine make it with battery acid and i deviated my septum doing that shit so <laughs> yeah don't do it just guys just don't and also you're annoying when you're on it so like you think that you're cool you're annoying you're not cool and you'll screw up your nose don't that's my final piece of advice. Wow. They make it with batter. Okay, watch a video of them making it. There was a, there's a um, food guru. I don't think it's Anthony Bourdain. It's someone. He literally went into like the middle of nowhere in the jungle and watched the process happen because similar to food, you have to cook cocaine. It's cocoa leaves. And it is horrific and appalling. Literally battery acid. I just, it's so don't do it like oh my god you you are worth your life you are better than putting battery acid in your face let me let me just whisper to you right now people who are listening don't 
put battery acid in your face. Please don't. It's not cool. I just, you'll ruin your nose. And your nose is beautiful. So don't do that. That's that's poetry. Yeah. yeah that's really <laughs> nice. I really like that. Yeah. Um, that's interesting too. And I don't want to, I don't want to like go on another tangent, but living in a city like LA where I feel like that is such a drug of choice for many. And when you're working crazy hours and all days and all nights and you're on production sets for like, you know, 20 hours a day. Totally. It's very, it makes sense why it becomes such a thing. Yeah. But do you think that Coke should ever be legalized? Oh my God. I just, it's such a horrific, the process is horrible. I mean, I think that's the thing for me is like, you look at how it's made and it's like, how can you justify that? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, I mean, similar to then crack cocaine, right? Like, I think you just start going down this crazy, like people die People get addicted to it. I I also think opioids should be more heavily regulated. People die. Like when there are things where people die, it should be studied. It should be regulated. I'm not going to say like ban it all completely. I, I don't know definitively that that's the answer, especially when you look at the alcohol industry. Um, but God, like what good comes of that? You know, I, I think... I again, I wish universal healthcare was a thing, like going back to how expensive healthcare can be. If people had access to therapists and the stigma was removed, and we could all advocate for work life balance through, you know, being confident and advocating for ourselves, I, I think a lot of these things all stem from this really unhealthy culture that we as Americans have created. Um, and obviously doing cocaine in order to handle set life like again you're right it checks out just like taking Adderall to do finals checks out there's just too much pressure on people to be this do everything and never sleep human especially in our industry in Los Angeles that it would be amazing to see people just take care of themselves and advocate for themselves and also be able to figure out their limits and what their darknesses are and mm. like bring them up and not need to rely on heavy drugs for yeah. that. Especially if you have family that's like got addiction issues. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's genetic and like we don't talk about that and there is stigma around alcoholism and you know, I have friends who go to meetings and are like happier, better, healthier people because they've acknowledged that they need sobriety and that's such, I just don't see enough people doing that. Yeah. Yeah. God, you, there are like 14 things that you just said that I want to talk about. <laughs> um, but two things. One is yes to going to meetings because I also have two really close friends who are a part of 12-step programs and it has absolutely transformed their lives totally. in, in amazing supportive ways. And yet even the fact, I get it. I get it. There's stigma. It's weird. I get it. But even the fact that it has the word anonymous in it, I'm like, okay, but like, if you talked about it, maybe other people would know that it's okay. Maybe there wouldn't be taboo stigma, kind of this like demonizing what's wrong with you kind of association with it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe we can break that in our, maybe we'll get it renamed in our lifetime. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and then the other thing was just that what I'm really hearing, and maybe this is like, uh, you know, me putting a bow on it. Cause I like to do that sometimes, but what I'm really hearing is that there is something beautiful about what the earth provides us in terms of herbs, in terms of natural things, whether it's weed, whether it's, whether it's mushrooms, things that won't kill you, things that can provide things that support your lifestyle in a way that will keep you healthier. Um, but when you get into addictive things, when you get into things that are going to take all your money, um, when you get into things that are going to impair your judgment and cause you to potentially die, that's where it might be. It might be time to check in on whether, whether you could be doing things like therapy or getting support in other ways. Yeah. Um, and like I said, maybe that's me just getting a takeaway from what you're saying and trying to put a bow on it. But that's what I'm that's what I'm really hearing in a lot of what you've said today. And um, I tend to really appreciate that approach. Yeah, that was a good bow. <laughs> I liked that bow. 
probably pink. It's a pink bow. <laughs> I'm into pink. <laughs> oh my gosh, amazing. Stick around for part two of this discussion, where we'll dive into the online portion of social media realities. This episode of Out of Line was produced by me, Caroline. All sound editing, engineering, and original music composition by Jaden Lee. And a big thank you to Cat Footwear for working with Out of Line this season. Hit subscribe to get the next episode on your mobile device when it drops next week. And if you love what you heard, please whip out a review, will ya?